what's up? Welcome to episode number 128 of the People We Love podcast. I am Adam Choit. If you're new here, what I do is interview people from all walks of life, most often comedians and other uh, entertainment types about their lives and careers. The conversation is casual, but I also ask everyone to highlight the people they love, who they admire, who have influenced them, inspired them, or supported them over the years. For more, check out peoplewelovepodcast.com. That's peoplewelovepodcast.com. On YouTube, just search People We Love Podcast. And the Instagram handle is at People We Love Podcast. And I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Adam Choit if you want to follow me. And please remember to tap subscribe or follow on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on. That is appreciated as our five star positive reviews on iTunes, Apple Podcasts. That is definitely helpful. I actually don't think iTunes is a thing anymore. I think it's just called Apple Podcasts. So I'm going to stop saying uh on itunes anyway i also have another podcast about the 12 ple- the 12 piece blues rock soul powerhouse band tedeschi trucks band uh it's a fan podcast at tedeschi trucks podcast if you want to check that out t-e-d-e-s-c-h-i trucks podcast that has been a lot of fun as well and it's tedeschi trucks podcast on youtube please be sure to subscribe and uh, follow that uh, show as well. But for today's guest of this podcast, I have Long Beach, California's own comedian Spencer Callender. As a kid, his two favorite activities were probably playing sports and being mischievous. From school pranks to the house, to the high school surf team, Spencer also recalls being a comedy fan as a as a young kid, and the kings of comedy having a profound impact on him. And one other major influence on Spencer's sense of humor was his grandpa David was an outgoing, gun-toting, gummy bear eating legend. But uh, let's just get started. Here's Spencer Callender. Okay, so it's good to see you today, Spencer Callender. Thank you for uh, joining me. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me on this podcast. Super amped. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, how are you holding up during whatever current year this is, whatever year this is? Yeah, we're in a 2-2. Two, two, yeah, it's Cinco de Mayo today. I'm holding up pretty well. I think things are getting better. I'm I'm liking life a lot more than a, a year ago, for sure. Oh, yeah, that's 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 good to hear. Um, you were telling me that you were, you, I mean, you were going through some, some just recovering from foot surgery or whatnot. Yeah, that's been boring. That's been uh, boring as hell. My brain has turned to mush. You're one of the only people I've even spoken to in like three weeks. But uh, no, I've talked to a lot of people. It's been just, yeah, just boring. You think when you have uh, like two weeks to lay on a couch, you're going to get a lot done, but you get way more done when you're actually productive because you're feeling better. When you feel better, you're going to gonna get more more done. I like that it's a low bar uh, set set for me that you've been bored out of your mind for the, you know, the last few weeks. So this conversation, it's a, a low bar. I appreciate that. Yeah, you have to compete with like, I don't know, reruns of The Sopranos, some of the books I'm reading. So yeah, I think you'll you'll do well. Yeah, well enough, maybe. Um, we can get into it. Why don't you tell me about a little bit about your background and, and, and where you're from and, and maybe something about your your family and whatnot. Um, I usually ask people what, what, you know, earliest memories, what jumps out at them, even like before kindergarten, if there's sounds or images or... Usually it's often it's bad memories, but it doesn't, you know, I'll let you kind of get into your story. Yeah, from uh, from Long Beach, California. My name is Spencer Callender. So, yeah, I'm a local. I'm not from L.A., but I'm from the very southern edge of L.A. County. And Long Beach, the I don't know, the best way to say I feel like Long Beach is like L.A. and Orange County kind of shoved together where it's neither of those things, but it's just kind of like a more mellow area my man my my earliest memory i think i think my earliest memory is uh yeah pretty happy one i think my my whole family lived in the same apartment complex so separate apartments but you know same complex so my aunt was upstairs my mom my dad my sister and i and then my grandpa and my grandpa's apartment was just uh just like a disgusting hoarder's den. And my first memory is like wandering. My my mom always said I wasn't allowed in there because he had he had a lot of guns. So she would uh, not want me to wander in, but wandering in and finding a huge tub of gummy bears and just uh, devouring. That's your grandpa's now. It's awesome. Guns and gummy bears. What else? What else could anyone really 
need or or want. You got to protect the gummy bears too from. Yeah, he he had it figured out. Yeah, for for sure. That's uh, that's that's cool. So you the kind of it's almost like your family was a, a community in a in a sense. In the beginning, yeah, in the beginning, this was like everyone, yeah, just yeah, from like zero to two or three, stuff like that. You had siblings, have siblings. I have one sister, one stepsister. Gotcha. And what were you, what were you like in like uh, elementary school and and whatnot? Were you smart? Were you into sports, music? What kind of kind of kid were you? Tell me about about that. Yeah, I think I was smart in some ways and dumb in some ways. Definitely, I was in a I was in the Rainbow Sherbet Reading Group, which was the upper echelon of all the reading groups. Chocolate chip cookie dough was the dumb were the dumb kids. Rainbow Sherbet were the smart kids. So. Uh, that's about all I can say for being in the smart group was uh, in the reading group. But yeah, I was into sports for sure. Anything competitive. Really, you know, that's why I liked elementary school because it was new sports every day, like steal the bacon, capture the flag, dodgeball, football, whatever it was, I was down. Then I was just kind of, I was mischievous. I would do weird stuff like uh, privately that I wouldn't tell anyone about. That <laughs> You're going to tell me now though? I yeah, I'll tell you. I mean, it's not, yeah, it's not even like, it's kind of weird, but it's not like a uh, bad weird, I don't think. But I would just, just start realizing like getting into shenanigans. Like I was in the bathroom in about fourth grade and I was kind of like fighting with the kid a little bit, not like fist fight, but, you know, pushing each other around. And I got pushed against the wall. My arm broke this light socket and I accidentally shorted out uh, the bathroom light, basically. And then I realized I could just do that, and I could short out lights in the school. So I just became obsessed with it. Never told anyone I was doing it, but I would just go around and undo these light plates and mess with the wires to short them out. How? And then, how? Bang your elbow like this every time? Oh, no. Well, that's the thing. It was a plastic piece. I started with bang my elbow. Um, that was the initial thing. But then I just, I had a, I don't know. I had a toolbox, so I had many tools. So I just went, found many screwdrivers, and I just started undoing the screws. And then, uh, actually, what happened is he started doing metal plates because I initially was just breaking with my elbow. And then when the metal plates came on, I evolved to the screwdriver. <laughs> and then he then he started doing Allen wrench screws, uh, the maintenance guy. And then I brought my started bringing an Allen wrench. So I just became obsessed with getting one over on the maintenance guy and just. It was just fun to like be able to short out the bathroom, be able to short out a classroom, uh, turn off the lights. <laughs> oh man, wow, that's that is that is interesting. That's a, that's that's a new one, I suppose. Did you have a did you dislike the, um, any of these people that you were doing this to, whether it was a teacher or the uh, or the the maintenance uh, dude? No, I never even knew who the maintenance guy was. I don't think I ever <laughs> saw him. So it was, yeah, I, I maybe I should have fought, tracked him down and apologized. Uh, but no, it had nothing to do with the maintenance guy. I liked doing it to my to my people I didn't like and people I liked. I would say my enemies and my friends. Like if someone's uh, taking a bathroom break and they have their pants in around their ankles in fourth grade and it goes pitch black, that's really funny. Yeah, that's been, done. that's been done to me. Yeah. Except that usually when you do it, there's a light switch. There's no light switch in this situation. So it was, yeah, it was, I got a lot of pleasure out. That's, uh, and what, well, you said that you're doing this in elementary school, right? Or, or, yeah, it was like fourth, fifth grade. Okay. So a couple, a couple, we got a couple of solid, solid years in there. <laughs> of yeah. I don't that. know how long I did it for, but yeah, that was, that was definitely the, the, the start of uh just i don't know being a little fucker kind of you, you know, told like, friends about this you told did you tell anyone i don't the only, i only told uh i didn't tell anybody the only person who found out was uh we were in like music class and i had we were in a sitting position you know indian style or crisscross applesauce is the 22 way to say it but uh like that and i stood up and a bunch of mini screws and a screwdriver fell out of my pocket <laughs> So this kid, Ryan, saw me, and uh, I just talked him into not telling anyone. Like, don't say a word, don't say a word. Very cool. Were you guys friends with this Ryan from that that point on? No, we weren't friends at all. I didn't like him. 
<laughs> he turned the lights But he had a realization him. because I had I had done the light thing to him while he was uh dropping a deuce. So uh, you know, you could kind of see in the eyes, like the realization, like looked at me, looked down, saw the screw, saw the screwdriver, like, oh, it's you. Oh, he liked it. He liked I think he liked having the knowledge and respected, you know, your work. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, it seemed like he was a fan, even if you guys weren't uh close what kind of what kind of kids did you you hang out with uh you know when you when you were younger when you were a kid and we can get into like middle school also yeah when i was a kid i seems like it was really just who was convenient you know that's who usually was, what uh, it is yeah who was in the neighborhood so i had the where my mom lived it was mostly apartments so on the street so i didn't really have I didn't really know any neighborhood kids, but where my dad lived was more just a, you know, regular neighborhood. So yeah, I had some, uh, like a Mormon kid across the street from me. She had a pool. Uh, her brother was into Wayne Gretzky. So that was a no brainer. Um, why is that yeah, a no brainer? Kids, why is that a no brainer? Well, just, I don't care what you're like. You're, you're the only kid I know with a pool. And well, there's I, know, I liked, I liked hockey a lot too. So I always want, you know, wanted to play hockey with her older brother. Did you play hockey growing up? Yeah. You so you're a California kid who played played hockey. Yeah, well, it was like street hockey and stuff. So it was like Cal, you know, like uh, I got you. You know, like Mighty Ducks too. When they go to when they go to the, I don't know, they go to South Central and play hockey with the kids. Like more like yeah, more street hockey stuff. I play. So Doesn't never... say I played all kinds of hockey too. Roller, ice, street. In, yeah, so I in elementary some... school. Yeah, some ice when I could, but just growing up here, there were no rinks. So I remember like, uh, like the process of looking into it and uh, being told like, this isn't going to happen. It was like way, way more expensive. And then you'd have to like go to practice at like five in the morning because there was only one rink in like 50 miles or something. Right. And during the day is like sessions and figure skating and other things going on or, you know, or it's closed and you just, it's, it's hard to find ice time to accomplish things i guess so were you, did you did you were in long do you were do you remember when wayne gretzky was traded to the kings was were you a big gretzky fan i don't i don't think i was aware of gretzky when he played for edmonton i think all my edmonton memories are hindsight and reading about it sure stuff, but i don't remember being aware of him until he you know until he showed up in black and silver again and so you're a big kings fan it sounds like and a big gretzky fan yeah 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 i like the kings i like yeah i like sports a lot so i like all the you know all the la teams which ones in basketball and well i mean La i go lakers but of all sports basketball is the one i care least about so i like uh i like hockey the most i like dodgers probably more than the kings just because it's more fun going to dodger stadium but yeah you have any favorite... kings and yeah i was gonna say do you have any favorite players growing up in any of these sports yeah i always liked uh kelly rudy who was not even really that great of a player but i thought he was cool he wore a bandana he was the king's goalie you know i liked um i liked dominic hasek a lot growing up watching him play were you like a goalie that. you play goalie is that, is that where no i always wanted to play goalie and i never did i remember i had like a. Uh, I got put on one of my first teams. I got put on the, like the worst team in the league. We we're terrible. Like, you know, like Mighty Duck style, except we just never got good. <laughs> uh, it was just bad the whole time. And I remember I was the only like kind of competent player on the team. And we were supposed to rotate every game, new goalie. And after the first game, I was the only one who scored any goals. And my coach was like, nah, you don't get to play goalie. You're our only, you're our only hope. But we still lost. Like, you know, we still lost like every game. Former Islander Kelly Hrudy also. I grew up oh, in, yeah. an, an Islanders fan. What about uh, going? Well, and I love, I mean, your, your Islanders, I love your Islanders from uh, from that time. You guys uh, won a bunch of Stanley Cups and then had that con artist show up and uh, fake by your team. That was awesome. Yeah, then the, the early 80s were better for the Islanders than the mid to late uh, 90s. I will say that for sure. Yeah. What about um, middle school, school, high school? What were you getting into besides some trouble? It sounds like, or I can, I can foresee. 
Perhaps. Yeah, I guess it escalated. Yeah, the lights were a gateway drug. Uh, that was when. Yeah, man, what did I get into? That was <laughs> yeah, that one took a little while. That was I got sent to a new school where I didn't know anybody. You know that kind of thing. So, uh, I'm pretty. You know, I'm kind of an awkward, weird dude at times. So, in the beginning of junior high, I was getting into no shenanigans whatsoever. I was I would literally just like go in the lunch line. And when I got to the front, go back into the back of the line because I was just like killing time. So that was what it was like for a while until I started meeting people. And yeah, I think I was the kind of kid like when I first got put into junior high, I got put into honors classes, but then just got kicked out and, you know, got kicked out of every one of them. So I think they had expectations of me to be an honors student and I disappointed them. I followed a similar track actually a little bit. Um, yeah, because elementary school was easy, if I recall, and then it get it got harder and harder. I think, and then, but I I wasn't getting smarter or wanting to work any harder. Yeah, I was wanting <laughs> to work way less because in elementary right. school, I really I had, in hindsight, those are my best teachers, the people who cared the most. So I was really into impressing them, and I think the older I got, the worse the teachers got. So I would have like one or two classes where I'd be like the best student in the world. And then all the rest would just be like, eh, you're not inspiring me. I'll figure something else out. Did you play sports uh, in high school or, or whatnot? Yeah, I played, what did I do in high school? I just do all my normal sports out the window. Like I always just played like hockey, soccer, uh, baseball. And then I just started, I played water polo. Wow. I was on the surf team and then I was on the swim team. Dude, that's a lot. That's a lot of things. You were on the actual all teams for all those things in high school, essentially. Yeah. I mean, they weren't all at the same time. Right. Of course. But uh, yeah, it would be first year I just did all surfing. And then uh, the next year I did was split water polo swimming. There's a fucking surf team in, on I know. These California high schools. Yeah, that's the one thing you always drop that and you forget everywhere else uh, does not have something like that. What's what's different about the uh, the surf team uh, versus other sports that you played or you compare that to another team sport? Like what is the what is that that like the dynamic amongst, I guess, the surfers and how that goes down? Oh, I did not like the dynamic. I don't I don't like I don't like the surfers or the culture that much at all. I always liked surfing, but they're just kind of like I don't know, all the surf kids in my high school were all uh they were just like these like little monkeys with no social skills, it seemed like they were all just really small, just these little groms, like they're all like five one, five two. They were all pretty popular because they could shred, but yeah, they're just weird, annoying little guys. <laughs> but yeah, the culture, I guess, I don't know, it's kind of close to swimming in the way that like when you are competing it's kind of an individual thing. You know, you're not on a team. It's not a relay. You're sure. in these heats against individuals. So it's really just like one-on-one -on -one, sort of, but yeah, it's hard. Yeah. It's weird. It's pretty different because you just want to basically do the be better tricks than the guy before you or catch a better, you know, catch a better wave. Hopefully that you got the better wave of the two that came in. People who surf love it though. Like just, it's, you're really one with nature and all those things. And there's, you, there's nothing you can compare to riding a wave. Someone described riding a motorcycle and going around like a bend around a curve where, you know, that kind of, that kind of sensation, maybe there's something like that in surfing, but is the feeling uh, of surfing and being good at it incredible? Cause I'm, I've never surfed in my life. Yeah. I mean, certain moments. Yeah. It is a uh, very, very incredible feeling when you hit things right i don't know you go out there early and like the sun is rising some dolphins jump by you know stuff like that and then you it's something it's it's nice to uh especially if you have to go to school or work after that like just a way to reset but yeah there are variations of that fishing is like that uh, i'm sure riding a motorcycle is like that whatever your thing is yeah stand up is like that you know the way that uh Surfing and stand-up are super similar in the way that all so many of the people I know that like 
really love, 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 love surfing way more than I do. Uh, they could just work their whole lives at a Starbucks, make minimum wage. As long as they're surfing, uh, they're all right. And that's kind of the comic mentality where, yeah, I just have a lot of comics just work shitty jobs, drive Postmates, drive Uber, whatever the hell they do. But as long as they can do comedy at night, you're cool. Yeah, because a lot of it is like comes down to, in my opinion, like your time, one's time. Like, what are you going to do with your your time? How do you like to spend your time? And if you find something that you really enjoy, that you're passionate about, that one is passionate about and gives you a meditative feeling, a spiritual feeling, whatever, that it just is fun. Like, that's why not? Why not follow follow that curiosity and and passion? For sure. Yeah, for 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 sure. Um, well, everyone tells you not to. Everyone tells you not to. Who are like our parents or something? Our parents and significant others. Yeah, or just a <laughs> lot of people. You'll just get into conversations, and you know they're always like, "So are you going to quit soon? You you know you still doing it? You still at it?" Why are people such haters? Am I a hater? Do I need to look in the mirror? No. I think people, some people just don't get it, you know. Or That's true. Just, I'm too hard. I'm too hard on, hard on people, and I, I assume they're haters, but they're just, they just, they're dumb and they're they're misguided. <laughs> take yeah. pit, take or pit. It, it could be from concern or something. Uh, I had um, my dad came at me one time, a couple of years ago, and he was like, "Oh yeah, remember when you said that?" Uh, if you didn't make it big in comedy in uh, two years, you were going to quit. And I told him, I, like, I never said that. No way I said that. Just because I know that, you know, I know it takes a while. So you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, uh, you said that. But it was, it was funny because it's like, uh, what do parents instill in you your entire life? They're like, uh, don't quit anything. You know, if you're going to start something, finish it off, follow it through. And he's turned it around like, uh, oh, yeah, anyway, they're hiring down at uh, Home Depot right now. You want to try that? So what, what did you think you were or planted like when you were in junior, senior in high school? Was the, what was your plan to go to college, work somewhere, pro surfer, pro athlete? Where were, where were we thinking we were headed? No, I was never good enough of a surfer to uh, to go pro. I knew that. that was, it was more just, you know, doing it for the fun of it. Uh, no, what did I think I was going to do? I really just I think I wanted to do comedy. I just would not admit it to anyone. I would not tell anyone. And I would just find like every excuse not to do it. But yeah, tell me about tell me about like when you started to get these thoughts and feelings and like who what comedy were you into? Like I guess throughout maybe your childhood going into high school, like what comedians jump out at you? What comedians jump out for sure? Uh, Greg Giraldo, Colin Quinn, Mitch Hedberg, George Carlin. Uh, Jim Gaffigan, Brian Regan. I don't think who I like growing up. Who I like growing up a lot was Jeremy Hotz. You know Jeremy Hotz? I don't know. Maybe. He's a, he's a solid working comic. He's not like well known or in movies or TV shows. But I remember seeing him when I was younger. He hit pretty hard. I don't think I was that picky back then. Oh, you know, actually, when I was young, like a elementary school. I never thought I could do it because of how big and like the production was, but the original Kings of Comedy, when that came out with Bernie Mac, Steve Harvey, DL Hughley and Cedric, dude, I went, I went to watch that like as many times as I could in the theater. That was the wildest shit I could think of like seeing a, seeing a comedy special in a movie theater. Uh, yeah. And just seeing like that there were friends hanging out, just kicking it, putting on crazy ass suits and doing comedy. That was pretty, uh, pretty cool how old were you when you when you saw that i want to i want to say like fourth or fifth grade wow that's that's pretty yeah, young and i'd you... have to look up when it came out but that was one of the uh because i don't think i ever saw like george carlin that young or anything like that so as far as young comedy experiences that that's one that really sticks in my head that's that's cool um dude did you i'm guessing you probably watched it over and over over again yeah, I think I, I went, like, literally, I think I went to the movie theater at least four times to see it. We'd just, like, uh, go skate down there, 
blow all my money, figure out how to get like eight more dollars, go back. Uh, yeah, and I lived close enough to a movie theater where I could skate there. But yeah, I went and saw that a bunch. Did you even understand? Like, I mean, I, I've talked about this often, how like we can still appreciate jokes if we don't even understand or appreciate comedy, even if we don't understand everything being said as as we're kids. It's just something about the comedian's mannerisms and and you do understand some some things. But like, did you know like what these people were talking about on the stage? I think so. I think a lot of their jokes, they're not, none of those guys are complicated or uh, this is going to sound insulting. It's not, but they're not, I don't think they're like super deep people or anything. They were just good jokes. And the, the they style. just do a lot of jokes, jokes about being kids. Uh, Bernie Max, a bunch of his jokes were about adopting his sister's kids. So, you know, a lot of, and I'm sure I didn't get a hundred percent of it, but that's in, that's interesting that you were so into comedy as a kid but I, but you i mean most people i've comics i've even interviewed like i didn't even know open mics were a thing i didn't even know how to get into it i didn't know that was even a, a job to be a, a comedian but uh, oh yeah still had no idea uh how to do it. you know not knowing about open mics or anything but by high school you were like i secretly want to do this <laughs> yeah still didn't know about open mics but uh and still didn't do it for a very, very long time. I didn't. I didn't start till I was like almost thirty. Yeah. Well, what happened yeah. from eighteen to thirty? Where do, Where do we go in your in your journey? I graduated high school, moved out of the house, then I moved up like. Uh, then I just didn't want to be in Long Beach anymore, so I moved to Flagstaff, Arizona. Hung out there for a few years. Uh, yeah, really, just worked went to school i didn't go to like necessarily go to i didn't go like really to school with intention to get a degree or anything but i just would take classes i liked at the junior college like you know semi-interesting ones and work meet people be what, dumb <laughs> what about what about family and and well comedy you said came later when you're you were you were 30 but uh what about what about family and stuff like that? When did that become a, th a thing? When did family become a thing? Yeah, well, don't you Wait. don't you have have uh, have have kids or did I? No, I don't it? have kids. I I you might think I have. That's probably my fault if you think I have kids. A lot of times on Instagram, I'll just uh, post vid videos or photos. If it's my niece or nephews, I'll just say they're my kids because. Uh, I don't know. I think it's funny. And then I like, I like using like hashtags like Instagram mom and world's best dad and stuff like that. So I do make, I definitely make people think I have kids because one comic came out to me at a show uh, a couple months ago and kind of came at me like, you're a piece of shit. I've known you for how long and I had no idea you had three daughters. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, actually, I so this was this That's was probably why you it think came I up in kids. conversation with with someone else. He was like, "Oh yeah, he he has he has kids or whatever." And, and but you're you're not you're not a married man, and you and you have no children. Am I, am I, is that the what what the, what, we're, what we're dealing with here? What's what's going on? No, you're half right. I am married. I don't have kids. Gotcha. I got a lady. No no children. Yeah. Okay. See, this is why I'm having the conversation. So I can yeah, it's good. We're getting to the meat of it, man. Get, get to know you better. So tell me again, you can continue your journey into how you got started in comedy and how you got started uh, being married and, and where life, where life uh, continued on for you from there. Yeah, I was living up in Flagstaff, met, uh, met a friend and met a friend up there who uh i don't know lives in la now and i do comedy with him so that's cool that's where i met him initially we were both uh we were we both took like an intro to acting class at, the, at this junior college i was talking about and we got cast in the odd couple together wow that's and cool. so yeah i've been friends with that guy a long time so that's been cool we who's the, basically who's that, who's that his name's keenan lewis I know he's a, he's an LA comic, and so we met there, hung out at a KFC buffet on Route 66, and worked on our lines, did the play, and yeah, ended up being roommates, stuff like that. So we've known each other a long time. He moved out to LA, 
and uh yeah he's about to get married so it's coming full circle i've known that guy for a long time very cool so very he was my first kind of like good moving out of the house as a you know as a as a young adult as a man sure yeah and then what else happened then then i left flagstaff i feel like i'm skipping a lot of stuff i don't That's know all right uh, yeah pretty much skipped all of high school but uh you mean you skipped talking about it or you skipped class I guess both, I suppose. <laughs> or you were really smart and uh, did you know skipped grades, or the no, entire I not, thing? No, I didn't skip grades. It was usually, yeah. I always had to do summer school. That was there was a lot of dumb stuff about being like, uh, I don't know, ignoring rules and stuff. You're like, yeah, I'm not going to go to class. Fuck this. I can go do. This. But then you, you know, you eventually, if you want to graduate, which I did, you still have to like, you know, go to summer school all that stuff but what else did i do when i worked when i lived in flagstaff for the most of the time i worked at this uh pretty hippie health food store and i'll say that's still to this day probably the best job i've ever had in my life why is that it was just a lot of fun a good age to do it they were uh you'd get really weird people you know not like a whole foods like the weird local stinky one sure and yeah you just worked with a lot of freaks you work with a lot of kooks and weirdos and yeah you meet a lot of cool weird people and it was a lot of fun there were no cameras in that store there was barely any supervision uh no one got in trouble for anything people would get caught stealing customers and they wouldn't do anything they would just let them have it and stuff like that so uh your job wasn't security (laughs) what i'm saying your job was not uh doing security no, they had no security. My job was putting milk on a shelf, wrapping up cheese. Oh, I see. It's like a whole, like, a, it is like a Whole Foods type, mom and pop stinky Whole Foods. Pretty much. Yeah. It eventually turned into Whole Foods, eventually bought them out. So, uh, yeah, a stinkier, crunchy Whole Foods. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. With some real stinky ass people. But places like that to check, because it's still just a regular job. But for whatever reason, a health food store, or even like a Whole Foods type store is going to attract a different type of employee than a Ralph's, I guess. Yeah, I, I guess I guess so. Because I've worked it, I've worked at both, and uh, the health food stores are way, way more fun. Interesting. Yeah, the people at regular grocery stores who work there are just kind of like sad alcoholics who uh, go drink by themselves, and the yeah. people at health food Facts. store. The people at health food stores are like uh, less sad alcoholic cokehead drug addicts who drink with a lot of people. I see. I'm learning a lot. I good, must, good. I must tell you about 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 a lot of different different uh, different things. Then what happened after? Um, yeah, I'm trying to see if anything's super exciting. Anyway, I like that gig a lot. Then. I moved to Oakhurst, California, which is pretty close to Yosemite. So that was cool because Flagstaff was right by the Grand Canyon. Then I went down to Yosemite. My grandma lived up there. My grandpa got sick. So went and kind of worked up there, hung out with my uh, grandma and grandpa until he passed away, lived there for a while. And then, yeah, dude, went back to Long Beach. And after living in Long Beach for a while, I started doing comedy. What finally pushed you into it? Uh, Kind of this, like what's happening right now with my leg, being on a couch, having surgery. Well, I had a surgery about five years ago. And I was laying on the couch for weeks, like watching uh, just shitty TV, watching like Teen Mom, just going out of my mind. It does something to your brain because it's not like just being alone because Dude, I've been, I can be a shut in sometimes. I'll be in my my spot for a few days by myself, but it's like not being able to move, being in the same position. Your mind just turns to mush, and I just wanted to go outside so bad. So I just kind of did one of those, like, you know, if you don't go do it, just basically made a decision. I'm going to 
as soon as I can, I'm going to go out and do it. Nice. Once I'm all better. And you and you went to an open mic or something in, in Long Beach? Yeah, it was in uh, Garden Grove. And it, it was uh, <laughs> called Tickles, run by this guy, Johnny Flowers, who's pretty awesome. But it was in this alley, like this garage, a garage attached to a sober living house. Johnny Flowers is just like, I don't know, just crackhead, been sober for a long time. But uh, still, you know, being a crackhead never really leaves you. I suppose not. And so it was, uh, not that he's still doing it, but he has that just kind of, you yeah. know, he's done some shit kind of, sure. and it's in a sober living house. But dude, that place was awesome. It was kind of like a comedy club. Like he set it up for, he would do it like twice a week, three times a week, something like that. Uh, it was an awesome spot. And yeah, then what happened? How'd it go that for you that first time? Went all right. Wasn't that bad. I, I went in with, uh, I went in with maybe better material than some people do for the first time, just because I had wanted to do it for a while. So while I wasn't performing, I was still writing. So it went way better than I thought as far as the actual jokes I had and the reaction, but it, it's just, you kind of like lose your breath when you get up there for the first time and kind of like that deep breathing. Like, I don't know if you like go cliff jumping and you landed some cold water, you know, that moment where you're like, <gasps> sure. It's hard to talk. It's kind of hard to breathe. So once you get over that, yeah, it was all right. Probably still, I probably have the recording. I might think differently. I might, I probably, I bet you if I listen to the recording, would say it's absolute dog shit. Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about, but in my memory, yeah, it was. You should put out that, are you going to put out that recording? I don't know. I don't, I never really put out any recordings. I'm very bad at doing video recordings of myself, but I have so many audio recordings. I've never released any of it. Do comedians, I, I guess I, I don't know if I've seen that, like, I mean, maybe it's probably, there's a reason for it. I can guess, but like just funny audio recordings, even of like past shows, like critiquing yourself. Oh my God, I can't believe I said that. Or I don't know, or, or how bad yeah. that is. Like making fun of the fun of a bad set or something. Yeah, I'm sure someone has. I always think about doing that, playing little chunks or I don't know, putting, I just don't know if anyone would listen. I don't know. With social so I, media. TikTok. It's like a five second TikTok, 10 second TikTok video or something. I don't know. I yeah, don't know it would have people to be short. Or I'd have to like mash up pictures with it or something. Make it right. like, make it a slideshow. Or I was thinking maybe I could just get like video footage of nature stuff, like lions tackling gazelles and just have my stand up over that or something like that. Just cool nature. You know, orcas. My, you know, humpback whales migrating to Mexico, and then just have jokes about uh, whatever the hell I joke about over it. See, that makes more sense to me after talking to you for a little, a little bit. Like I follow a little bit of the methods of madness. <laughs> if you open with that, I'd be like, "What's happening right now? Where is this all coming from?" But you know, a half hour, whatever later, <laughs> I feel like I have more of an understanding of where these images and ideas. Are, are are coming from tell me more about your, your your comedy journey and and i guess finding your voice and and uh and where we went after that first front where do we go from after that first open mic yeah i didn't really go anywhere after that first open mic my first dude i might have my timeline wrong a little bit but it's I'm been a long life sure. for all of us yeah what i'm pretty sure happened is i went up started doing it i think i did it one time maybe twice and then i was saying how i went up north to take to live with like my grandma and grandpa while he was sick that was my step grandpa so but my real grandpa was i was real tight with him he was probably like my biggest comedy influence as far as just like a per you know funny guy in my life and what then was his he name? died what was his name? his name was david grandpa david grandpa david yeah he was, was the one it? with the gummy bears in his apartment oh you know, that guy from I the see. beginning so yeah he went down like uh yeah that was that was wild i like done comedy i believe two times same place tickles monday wednesday 
and then I think that the next day I got a call that he had uh no one really knows like exactly what happened but he they found him same apartment building that same apartment building that I was like lived in when I was a little kid like he was in his underwear like outside with like his head kind of like bashed in but he had a gun in his hand and he had a bottle of Patron in his other hand he had just like started uh getting into tequila with this girlfriend he had and so it was like this kind of seemed like a weird i don't know it seemed like kind of in hindsight a cool way to go but i think honestly he just like had a stroke or something while he was out there he was probably out there with his gun like fucking around but uh yeah i don't know i don't think there was actually like an intruder or attacker i think he really just like fell smacked his head on a rock and that just did him in wow so anyway i took that i took that bad i did not handle it all that well and so i just didn't do comedy at all for about a year and then after that year, um, I just, I don't know, whatever happened, I just started, I was living in Long Beach and I just started driving up to LA every day after work, you know, doing all the normal open mic shit. Yeah, you were ready. I'm sure that that hit you hard. What was it about uh, Grandpa David that made him a comedy influence on, on you? Just charming, big, loud, funny, just good, like, good schmoozer you know you'd go to the liquor store and he'd get into a good conversation with the dude there you you know you'd be at the donut shop he'd get into some funny stuff there he would uh yeah he was just quick very that's, quick that, that's cool. good jokes yeah real good jokes what kind of like uh sense of humor did he have was he like sarcastic was he was he silly was he like maybe witty like you were kind of insinuating perhaps yeah he was quick he wasn't all that sarc. he wasn't sarcastic no i'm trying to think uh i mean he was an old guy so yeah a lot of it was just uh a funny yeah, charmer. fucking with funny yeah charming and just kind of fucking with people like uh he would like he was friends with the with the guy at the donut shop one and he like brought a my grandpa was single. He'd always like try to pull like younger girls. He like, you know, he was sleazy in that way. And he would like bring a girl to the donut shop and then start pointing at stuff and being like, bong, ding, dong, do you just speaking gibberish? But his friend owned the donut shop. So his friend would then grab all the stuff he wanted just because he already knows his order and give it to him. And so the girl would be like super impressed. Like, oh my God, this guy. This guy speaks Chinese. This guy's speaking Chinese right now. Oh man, he's he's got the in at the the donut shop, Grandpa. That's that's the yeah, yeah. that the that's that's the hip happening spot in in uh in well, I guess long in Long Beach is you were saying he was he was still there, right? In that same yeah building all that time. Yep. So yeah, he was he was a good hang. He was like uh, yeah, he was funny as hell. <laughs> Fond, fond memories sounds sounds like, and then after after a, a year later, or whatever after his passing, you were saying you were getting back into comedy, you, you were ready and 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 driving to L.A. every day, and and you, I'll let you continue on with uh, where do we go from there? Yeah, just hitting up every uh, every goofy ass open mic around. There's this one place called Marty's that was around for a while, where it was open seven days a week, just all day every it was a place just for open mic comedy that's all they did there they had a front stage they had a backstage uh meet a lot of cool people there that was a good hang and yeah just running around the city having that kind of like uh high school experience again almost you know where you're like meeting these new friends and you're all like optimistic and bright-eyed and you're going out and doing shows and yeah it's just a lot of fun do you st- are you still bright eyed and 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 whatnot? I mean, to to some degree, I think you have you have to be. I guess speaking, I don't yeah, know. it's it's got to be there. I mean, yeah, it balances out and gets you know more unrealistic and stuff like that, or just stuff that you're not willing to do. Your tolerance or your threshold goes down, or you know, there'd be stuff where I'm like drive, be down to drive. One time, I drove all the way to Wyoming to a show that. uh I knew I wouldn't profit off of, or I would just end up breaking even, you know, like there's no way I was going to 
make any money and I'm going to drive all the way to Wyoming. But it's like, hell yeah. I want to, I want to do comedy in Wyoming. I want to do comedy in Wyoming, obviously. So I'm going to do it. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, for the experience. And that, and that could be val, valuable, valuable experience that you draw on later in life for, you know, professional insight, you know, something about comedy in your set or something. There's always something to be learned. Maybe there's nothing to um, be learned. Yeah. I'm glad I did it. I got to camp for two days. So, uh, well, and just stuff like, I don't know, when you're young and bright, I'd like, you do, you do stuff for free that you wouldn't have done otherwise, you know, you wouldn't do if you're doing comedy longer, you know, it's a sleazy city. So people come, they take advantage. Uh, some do, some don't. But, Talking about Los Angeles? Yeah. yeah. All the weirdos you meet in comedy. Sleazy weirdos in LA in comedy, you're saying? Potentially? Shocking, but uh, it's true. Well, not uh, even comedy. I mean, name anything. Actors, musicians. Right. Sure. It's just, yeah, it's a bunch of very selfish people with dreams. So uh, Yeah. So, yeah, you find cool ones and you hang on. Yeah, selfless people with dreams or people who are a little bit more, less selfish or more selfless is, is what you want. To or if they're selfish, at least be not be phony about it. I think that's the right. thing where there it's like I'm I have friends who I like hanging out with. I would never like ask them for anything, ever expect them to, do, you know, because I know they're assholes, but they're funny or they're cool. But, yeah, they're uh, I'd rather yeah be be a be a real one. That's something one learns, I think, over time. Just, just if it, for me, is learning who are your, I guess, real friends, who people who you can rely on, for versus like just people who are fun to be around, which is fine too. Um, but to to sort of put people in those categories or boxes, not boxes or categories, but like to uh, what's what's the word uh, to set compartmentalize different yeah and it's just as long as you're aware you're not right tricked so when that person does an asshole thing like oh yeah that's gary that's gary's move so you know it makes sense or like yeah you have a group friends or individual friends why would gary do that to me though if i saw gary at that barbecue that three times and we had like a good conversation about football like i i thought me and gary like we were had something special and then he goes and does does that bad thing gary's a phony he doesn't even <laughs> watch football he was googling stats in the bathroom he does yeah he gary's phony he's full of shit man yeah we're learning about the this is the the, tr the truth of the real la this yeah is, it's a, this is an obligatory conversation i i think but then it's good like when i was new i think being open and optimistic uh you know, it open it gets you places too, or you know, having that cheeriness or good attitude. Because I was doing comedy uh, for a little while, and then I ended up being able to. I got a show, a belly room show at the comedy store for almost three years, so that was really nice. And I'm very grateful to the person whose show that was to let me be on, because uh, being only like a few months into comedy and all of a sudden being able to have a real audience every single Sunday night was fucking rad. So I think that helped me out a ton because when you do all open mics, it's tough because you want to, uh, you're making comics laugh. So it's, you gotta, you gotta be able to make real people laugh too. Yeah. It's a whole, whole different dynamic. I'm sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. What happened after that? What yeah. are some highlights, some highlights of, of, uh, of comedy so far? Oh. Either external or internal highlights, cha personal challenges that you've achieved or, or, you know, whatever. Else. Yeah. Just all the normal, like, uh, accomplishments that i'm happy about like being able to play at all the clubs that i thought were really cool when i was younger or clubs i went to before i was a comic so it's like cool i've got to play at the improv i've been able to play at the comedy store uh i guess those are the two never done the laugh factory but 
you know, so doing those things, that has been really cool. Meeting p certain people has been really cool. Some of uh, the uh, just random surreal, not even like the big famous people, but just like the real, I don't know, like Corey Feldman and his angels show up or you see like fucking, you know, Chris Angel Mind Freak showed up one time on a motorcycle, did a magic trick and just drove away stuff, you know, weird ass stuff like that. But I think. <laughs> Spontaneous highlights and moments. You never, you never know what's gonna happen. again. Like, yeah, uh, L.A. giveth and L.A., you know, has its cons too. Yeah, I think the highlights described. are really just any time, really just getting to leave L.A. and do shows out of town, out of state, especially when the other comics on the show are your friends, because that's just a road trip with your friends. So uh, those are super fun and. I guess the peak of that was one time, it was like the first time I had done kind of like a small little successful tour and I planned it and brought all, brought some of my friends and I had, uh, we were just in the middle of the woods uh, on acid and I hadn't taken acid. I don't even know if I had ever taken acid or maybe I had, I don't know, but it was just <laughs> nice, clean, fun. Uh, felt like I don't know. Had like felt like you're like stand by me kind of Goonies vibe. You know, like you're you're like this is what it was almost like. You get to have the experiences you thought you'd have in high school, like friends stuff and hanging out and getting into stuff. But you were too young or dumb to get into. So it's like this weird, weird reset. But basically, anyway, basically it was just this is a shitty story. It was really good acid, and our friend Feng Chao, who was a part of it, got sick. And these two, we were right by train tracks and these two giant trains drove in opposite directions, passing each other. And we got them to both lay on the whistle and we were like 20 feet away from them. So it was very loud and profound to us in that moment. So it was like the lights of the train while my friend and I are taking a piss in the woods, watching our friend throw up. It was, yeah. It's a lot Ooh. happening in that moment. Oh, baby, yeah, yeah. And I think there's a lot. There's probably a deeper meaning to all of those those things, sort of coalescing, if that's the right word. At the same time, I tend to look for meaning where there might not be meanings in certain events and and the way things things happen. But yeah, and uh, oh, I'm sure there's meaning there. I'm still friends with all those guys who. That's uh, you know, the meaning. Yeah. Friendship. Yeah, there you go. Boom, nailed it, Adam. <laughs> Yeah, friendship and fun. And yeah, it allows you to reconnect with people. It's cool. And just, yeah, being being out of town and having people really dig your show is always fun. Like when, not just like, oh, they like my comedy, but they're like, oh, they like all these people I brought with me, the people that I thought were funny too. And sometimes it can be just the show's over and you're done. And then sometimes it can be just become super communal. And the entire show ends up hanging out like it's an after party. And yeah, you just get to meet a lot of weird ass people. That's really all I want to do is meet weird people. Hang happy out to with help. Weird people. I'm happy, uh, happy, yeah. happy to be Absolutely. a service. Yeah, you're in. Sweet. So when I look at my friend group, that my non-comic friend group, they're all uh, pretty kind of weird, antisocial uh very very funny people all the people who i hang out with are funny as hell but they're not they're not comics they're not comics you know they're just uh true freaks and uh man that's yeah. sweet that's that's well said <laughs> <laughs> well well put well um what about uh what you know how's the comedy going life going now what about uh where are we going to be in a year from now two years from now are you doing any? Do you do? Uh, are you doing any acting or writing or any other things besides uh, stand up? Or are you just straight up, straight up stand up, dude? Straight up stand up, dude. Uh, yeah. What's go What's good right now? What's going on? Yeah, it's just coming out of COVID has been. Uh, things are getting better. Obviously, I've been out of commission for a little while. So that's right. Yeah. Going to. I've done comedy like three times in the last three weeks, just because of my leg. I've only been going to this one place once a week where I know I can like. Uh, 
keep my leg up and shit, do all the stuff the doctor, do all the stuff I used to ignore. But now I'm, now I'm mature, so I'm going to listen to my doctor. There you go. But uh, yeah, I think the best thing lately to come out of comedy was COVID because of all the underground comedy that was going on and the communities that were formed. So I feel like some of the best during the COVID years, I think I've seen some of the best comedy I've ever seen and been able to uh, work at it in a totally different way. So coming out of that's been good. And yeah, I've got some, I don't, I don't act. I've never really acted. All I've really acted in is doing people's sketches and stuff like that. Upon request. Upon request. Yeah. <laughs> doing, yeah. Doing sketches, doing, I don't know, Instagram videos and stuff like that. I used to, I like doing man on the street, interviewing strangers, that kind of stuff. That's and then I write. Yeah, I write a lot. Material. Yeah, material, stories, uh, stories that I try to turn into scripts, but I don't really have a good grasp on the script thing yet. Yeah. I'm a slow learner. That's all right, but you're persistent and you stick with it and you got many different things you're working on and you're meeting cool people and and uh, and you seem to be someone who makes the best out of a situation, whether it's of your own doing or circumstances to, to make the best of things, whether it's well, I COVID think that's why or, can, or that's foot why injuries. I can make the best of it because usually it's uh, my fault. You know, most of my, I feel like a lot of my misery is my own fault. So uh, usually, like, hey, what are you gonna do? You yeah, know, I'm not mad at I'm not mad at the world about it. But yeah, I think the optimism of COVID was just because there was this uh, like fake comedy club that started not fake but like underground called the Litter Box that just uh, was was good three times a week. Being able to do 20 minutes a night all through the pandemic was so so helpful. Nice. Nice. Uh, I, I remembered. What about uh, ghosts and aliens? Do we believe in those? And have, have we had any experiences? Yeah, uh, man. No, I haven't had any ghost experiences at all. And no alien UFO sightings or anything like that? I've seen stuff like when, I don't know, I've camped out in Sedona and definitely seen what i guess i would consider a ufo out there but i know that that's one of the best star gazing places in the entire world based on its location and it's clear this it's low light it's a low light city and it's clarity so who yeah i have no idea what i've seen but that is the type of place that attracts that sedona it's you were very... not you were not able to identify the object so what what would, yeah. we, what would we call it it's unidentified by default yeah <laughs> right <laughs> yeah i'll go with the alien thing like sh yeah I'll, I'll believe that because uh i don't know i hear this all the time but just that the universe is so big you know it's narcissistic to think we're the only ones but and then no i don't think i always go back and forth with that ghost thing whether or not i believe or not because i've never had it anything like that i've tried doing the ouija board i've stayed in haunted places i've been in i feel like i put myself out there to see it and then the only people i know that i've personally spoken to who have had ghost experiences have all been women interesting and i bartend so i get a lot of drunk women telling me about ghosts it happens all the time are you skeptical is what you're was what you're insinuating i'm a little skeptic well no one's none of these people they always tell me like well i recorded stuff or i have photos but they never really give you enough but the one thing this is what i'll this is where my belief would come in because my what i'm thinking is maybe all that stuff's out there i just don't have the antenna to it um i'm in tune with fucking let's say i'm maybe i'm in tune with planet earth and people who are alive now and some people are but anyway I've got a cousin who's autistic and before she, we knew what that was, or she was diagnosed, you know, when she was young, we we're just like, what the fuck, you know, this kid's crazy. What the hell is she doing? And she would do this weird thing where she would 
like walked in one time and she was basically sitting in a corner talking to my dead great grandmother who I don't think she knew anything about and was kind of like too young and out of it anyway. So that seemed like a real ghost encounter. But then once they diagnosed her, they put her on a bunch of medication and kind of numbed her out. So she's not like, she doesn't do crazy shit anymore, but she's also, she's heavily sedated and she doesn't do that anymore, but it could be the drug stopping her from connecting to the afterlife. Maybe. Let's get her off the meds. Uh, yeah, maybe I maybe, I maybe don't that. listen to me. I don't, I don't know. No, I want to get her off the meds. She was way more fun back then. I mean, it was, it was a wild card, but uh, definitely way more fun off the meds. Then she's a conduit to a whole nother world. That's fucking awesome. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, I feel like the romantic part in me wants to believe, you know, wants to. And then it's one of those things where if like so many people have experienced it. How could it be wrong? But at the same time. Yeah, no, absolute proof. Actually, I said it was all women. I have an uncle who had a ghost story with my with my grandma, his mother, and she said that like his thermostat kept going down. And then he kept turning it back up and then it would go down again. And then he said that he went, mom, if that's you, don't do it again or something. And <laughs> he never did it. Never. She never did it again. But I will say of all my relatives, my uncle's got to be the most full of shit, narcissistic, uh, just liar of anyone in the family. So I, yeah, I wouldn't trust his word. Yeah. No one in your family would ever mess with electronics uh, in, in any building. We know that. We've, 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 <laughs> Whoa, we've, nice. We've we've learned that. Nice callback. It's genetic. <laughs> On that note, um, I definitely appreciate the stories and the time. We 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 covered a lot. I think we covered it all. There's no way we covered it all. But in my mind, I think I just like to say that. Um, it was linear. So you know, you we went down river, up up river, either way. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Why don't you tell people where they can find you, follow you, or anything else you want to mention? I'll I'll give you the give you the floor. Uh, yeah, Ro Robot Spencer would be my social media, my Instagram. I keep that current. That's also my Twitter, but I do not uh, use it. I have a podcast called Hats Off, Gloves Off. So look that up, Pogo Pod on Instagram. Oh, I've never promoted that before. Cool. You've yeah, done it now. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, competing podcast. Hey, we're all, all yeah. the, all, was it all boats, all tides ra raise all boats? What the fuck is that phrase or some shit? Rising tide I, raises all boats. Yeah. I've never one heard that. Washes that is one hand washes another. Yeah. I like the boat one though. Cause I like, yeah, I like the nautical reference and it's true. It definitely is. And then I don't, hopefully this, it should still be relevant. If anyone is listening and wants to see me, I'll be at the Hollywood Improv on May 20. Nine. Very cool. Very cool. Um, again, That's it. thank you. Um, what a fun journey it's been. I'll let you get on with the rest of your evening and uh, let's talk more soon. Yeah, cool, man. Thanks, Adam. Oh, thank you, Spencer. Later. Bye. There you have it. Episode 128 and my conversation with Spencer Calendar. That was uh, a lot of fun and I definitely appreciate his time. That dude is a character. I will say that. But anyway, for everything about this show, of course, head to peoplewelovepodcast.com, at peoplewelovepodcast on Instagram, at Adam Choi is me on Instagram and Twitter, Tedeschi Trucks Podcast, my other podcast is at Tedeschi Trucks Podcast, T-E-D-E-S-C-H-I Trucks Podcast on Instagram. But I think that's about all I got for today. Um, I appreciate uh, you guys listening and supporting. Uh, thanks as always, and uh, let's talk soon. Peace.